And we are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Sea of Reality podcast. We are here with Dan Sperry. Dan, how are you doing today? I don't know yet. How are you? <laughs> well, good. Yeah. <laughs> Bit early in Vegas compared to our days over. So, but, but you... pretty much. I mean, uh, to, to some degree, yeah. But um, I've actually been doing pretty good about adjusting my. Uh, my my sleep schedule and stuff so usually yes this would be early for me but um you don't have to get up early if you don't go to sleep right so that's true <laughs> definitely so I, I think we'll start the podcast where we start with everyone is how did you first get into magic fall in love with it all that good stuff uh yeah i mean um i've i've, I've answered this on other podcasts and interviews and stuff so your listeners can just search it yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they, they they can really just look. It was Copperfield. In the, in the end, it was fucking Copperfield. Yeah, that, uh, that that got me into it. But it was in. It was more so. Um, it's a long story, so I'll try and like paraphrase, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. It, it happened when I was younger. Basically, like, um, I mean, you you guys are in Ireland, so you guys yeah. never, re- you guys didn't really have a copper. I mean, maybe Keith Barry, you know, was you know he kind of came along as a big deal. Who's freaking awesome, by the way? One of the few mentalists, uh, probably one of only three, that I think are actually good and worth watching, especially if you're a layman, you know. Yeah. And uh, and and uh, and and so I I saw Keith's show when he was here in Vegas, and and I thought it was I thought it was great, really uh, really well done. Uh, anyway, so um, but uh, what the hell was I even talking about? Oh right, God, <laughs> right. So, you guys- <laughs> You guys kind of had like Keith Barry, but I'm assuming like some of the Brits like came over too. Like, did you guys have like um like Paul Daniels? Paul yeah, Paul Daniels. Daniels. Okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Paul Daniels. Yeah, that's All right. Right. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so we had, so we, basically Copperfield was like the big dude, right? I mean, yeah. I'm trying to find a comparison, I guess, in a way. So Copperfield was like the big dude, but I didn't know that because I was so young, right? And so I just knew like, oh, I'm gonna go see a magic show. I don't know anything about it, but now it's in this big theater. I didn't know illusionists were a thing. You know, like, my only, um, like, resource or exposure to magic was, like, dudes coming to a, a kid's party or a library or something, you know? Yeah. So I didn't know what an illusionist was. I didn't know magic could be big and theatrical with lights and fog and blah, blah, blah. And so he he, he opened with the death saw, right? And uh, I'm, I'm assuming most people that listen to this too, by the way, are magicians to some point, right? They're yeah. they're not so much muggles, so I can say things yeah. like that, saw, and they get what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, okay, say so whatever you want. That saw. Right. So he opens with the death saw, and me being like five, I don't know what this is. So I see this guy basically die on yeah. on the operating table, and and I freak out because I don't know what's going on. We have to leave and go into the lobby. To like calm me down. My grandparents took me, so we had to go to the lobby car. I'm not calming down. We had to leave. I never saw him get put back together, and so that was my exposure. And so, like then, like it became like a thing of like home therapy from magic kits, like the little Marshall Brodeen magic kits from the toy store. Um, my dad actually was into magic a little bit growing up, not not so much, but he actually, believe it or not, randomly had I don't know the. Uh, these names might not make so much sense to you guys over there, but uh, he had a, an old catalog from like the 60s from Abbott's and from mm-hmm. Tannings. Now, Abbott's is like mm-hmm. our Davenport's essentially, but ours is still open. It <laughs> sucks to be you. But like, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like traditionally speaking, with all the respect to Davenport's, I mean, God bless them for hanging on as long as they, uh, as long yeah. as they did. Uh, so, you know, here, here's the Davenport's, man. But, uh, but so it was like our Davenports and, you know, and Tannins was like our Supreme, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and so I had, uh, had these catalogs and me being young, not understanding what inflation is. Right. <laughs> so I'm seeing, I'm seeing, and this is my first magic catalog, right? So I'm seeing products listed for like 10 bucks, you know, <laughs> for like a fucking Miss Made Lady or something, you know, <laughs> and I'm reading this shit going, holy, but this is amazing. Like, 10 bucks and two more months of mowing lawns and making my bed and i'm gonna be on top baby you know so <laughs> not understanding you know in place so then it comes to like wanting to order and uh and that was a whole nother process to, to to figure out you know i had to grow up really fast for a lot of reasons but one of them was magic you know and like <laughs> yeah. awesome 
Yeah, I, I definitely think that having the not being able to see someone be put back together kind of explains a lot of your gore styling in your magic. That's just like, yeah, just leave the person cut in half and that's a better experience. That's <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably to a degree. I mean, my dad was also really into like Universal Studios monster movies and stuff, you know? Yeah. So like I would watch like The Mummy and Frankenstein and, and Dracula. Like I, I could recite like the names of like Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr. and Bela Lugosi and, you know, all these guys uh, before I even knew, you know, our, the, the name of my principal or my teacher <laughs> at school, you know? So yeah. that, that's kind of that's where that stemmed from as well to a degree. Yeah, I was going to say that, actually. I mean, your character is very, or, or, or who you are as your persona, is very influenced by, like, horror movies and that kind of kind of rock star kind of image. Is that something that's, like, true to you, or is that something that's just kind of developed with time? Well, I mean, I don't know. I just I just do me, you know? Yeah, and yeah. especially now more than ever, because it's after you've lost everything, are you free to do anything, right? So, yeah. like, I, I just have always just kind of done what I did. But the truth is, when I started out when I was younger... Um, I'm, I'm from the, the, the forest, I'm from the woods up North here in America. Right. So it's a, it's yeah. a fairly conservative area, rural, you know, I'm, I'm from a place called Minnesota. It's right next to Canada. We have tons of woods and lakes, you know, there's hockey, hunting and ice fishing. That's about it. You know, sure. and so, uh, <laughs> so I was out in the boonies and I didn't have any friends that were into magic or anything that it was just pretty much the only thing that I had. And so all my friends though, were into like you know, punk rock music and horror movies and professional wrestling and stuff like that. Like, I remember I sold, um, I had a PlayStation that I sold at a pawn shop to swap and trade it for a, a camcorder so I could film myself rehearsing magic. But I also used that with my friends in like middle school, a buddy of mine would write horror stories and I would do the makeup for them and we'd film them like in the backyard. We'd get our friends and we'd make these horror movies I dub it onto a VHS tape and then we'd rent it to our classmates and make money off of it. Right. And so, and so, and, and so like all of this, this sort of make believe living in, in not the real world is something I've kind of always done, you know, uh, for the most part. And that friend actually uh, reviews uh, pro wrestling on YouTube now. So yeah, everybody, everybody's following up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking with pro wrestling, you're definitely like the undertaker of the magic world. So that, that's the, the dark and gothic style. Oh, okay. I got, uh, cool. I'll go with that. I was I was always really, uh, I was a Ric Flair, Bret Hart fan. Uh, yeah. I like Kurt Hennig. You know, we, well, I mean, you guys, you guys uh, had Davy Boy Smith and stuff. So he's, you know, he's part of the Hart, you know, dynasty. So yeah. there's, there's a little six degrees of Bret Hart there for us, at least. Yeah, yeah. And now we have a... Uh, the, the Irish have really taken over in pressure wrestling lately. <laughs> you know what they really have? And, and I'm okay with that because mm -hmm. I feel like it kind of got like magic, a little too many fucking Asians, you know? Like <laughs> Japan pro wrestling coming over and they're flipping and flying, which is fucking amazing. Like the yeah. stuff that those guys do in New Japan is awesome. But it's like, it's like fism, you know? It's like the past <laughs> six fisms. Like, Jesus, fuck, the fucking Asians are back. Well, we might as well go home now, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, remi it reminded me, I was watching The Queen's Gambit on Netflix about chess, and they were like, oh, the Soviets, there's no point even showing up because the Soviets are here, and that is like, yeah, you, when you show like, up to a magic convention, it's just like, nah, my, I'm just going to put my cardistry away, and I won't even bother with a pass because everyone's going to see it, so that's useless. Right, no, I mean, that's totally, and but it's funny because I've, I've told this to people, um, it was, it, it, it kind of goes through waves, right? Like, before, it was the Asians, then it was like, the the fucking Germans, you know, like Topaz, Roxanne, Julius Frack, you know, all these guys were coming up with crazy themed acts where it was like the same thing in the 90s. It was like, God damn it, you know, or like in the mid 90s, if there was a bird act that was Canadian, you were fucked, you know, like <laughs> if Bruin showed up at Burn, you know, Demare, James Seelin, you know, you're just fucked. Just go home, you know. Put the birds away, go home. <laughs> when did you when did you first get into the bird act? Was it was it like Lance Burton or along those lines that first inspired you? No, it was uh Joseph Gabriel. Mm. Oh, a little frozen. Do we a little bit of froze? Yep. Actually. Am I frozen? Ah, there we go. It's okay. back. <laughs> it froze for a second, put it back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably because I don't know. I, I think the FBI is listening to me a lot, so that might. Be <laughs> right. 
Um, but uh, but so it was Joseph Gabriel because I, yeah. I had a dub that I just one that I used in like a dub pan and dub back in kid shows and you know libraries and the you know the basic show stuff that I was doing at the time. But it was Joseph. It was seeing Joseph Gabriel's act that made me really go like, "Whoa, I want to learn that," you know, because um, it just seemed. You know he was he was cool and classy like Lance, but he was I, Lance. I and 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 I, and I don't want this to get you know misinterpreted. Uh, so like not to say Lance wasn't a badass because Lance really was a badass. Like there's some stories yeah. about Lance that it's like don't <laughs> let that Kentucky accent fool you. He's like fucking mafia from Kentucky something. But like um, <laughs> but so. But Lance just, you know, Lance, you know, was cool and, and smooth and, and traditional. And actually, that was the kind of magic that I was really influenced by. Like, guys like Neil mm-hmm. Foster. Um, I liked Alan Shaxson. Uh, I really liked that. I saw him, I saw him at, a, at a convention, at an Abbott's, actually. I saw him at an Abbott's and uh, thought it was great. And, um, uh, and Scott Penrose. Scott Penrose has actually borrowed my dubs at one time. And I borrowed his. So there's that. Still alive. Ooh. Still alive. So don't, <laughs> don't listen to fake news. They're all still alive. And uh, so... Alan Shaxon um, taught me how to do the knife through jacket really early on in my career at a at a convention. I I had done a routine and I had a knife in in the routine. I was doing a I was doing a card stab and then he was like, "Oh, be a great follow up to do knife through jacket." And then he took me to the side and just talked to me there. It was amazing just to just to yeah, talk to him about awesome. the routine. That's see, that that's really us. Awesome. I like stuff like that. I like hearing those stories. You know, there were a lot of guys that that honestly uh, helped me with that. Guys that like when I was younger at conventions would let me just hang at the booth. And if I couldn't afford something, you know, they would still be cool enough to at least maybe show me a move or an idea, you know, uh, or even so far as I'm sure you guys have experienced it too, which, you know, unfortunately I feel this is something that is lost now because of the unfortunate demise of brick and mortar shops. But, you know, you go on to Penguin, you think, you know, you think they're going to say, you know, listen, man, this is actually a really shit trick. What you should get is this thing instead. This is more your skill level, and you know, ba ba ba. You 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 lose that. That's gone now. Yeah. You know, with this, yeah. and that's something that I think was, uh, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not even that old, but I sound old when I say this because now with with the wave and change and that things are going and magic is getting ex- not exposed as far as secrets, but the exposure through the internet and TV and stuff. Uh, I think it's showing that uh, you know a lot of yeah, a lot of people coming up didn't didn't get raised that way in the business or in the yeah. industry, and I think there needs to be more of that. You know, kind of like, <laughs> kind of like a, I don't want to say like kind of like how boomers, you know, talk about millennials or something. You yeah. know, that aggressive. <laughs> but metaphorically speaking, there's people coming up that never got told to make their bed and had to mow their lawn. You know, and uh, yeah. you know that kind I think, of thing. I wonder I think why. Problem, you know, problem with some of that as well is that magicians coming up don't know the foundations of magic or they don't know. The history of magic or they don't know the move or they don't know who created the move or whatever so they don't really have an appreciation for it more than just the effect that they're doing but they don't realize that the effect they're doing can be a hundred effects if you know where it came from the method the theory and everything else. oh yeah yeah or just uh yeah just be, being familiar and and being able to apply applications uh, to an idea that may be stemmed from it but unless you you know this history or oh you know so and so did this once but instead of using goldfish he used toads or whatever you know and yeah. you know just just having that that knowledge and and exposure and research just is 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 lost uh on a lot of people i think you know yeah definitely man. even for me i found i was i was an apprentice to another magician for about a year when i was a teenager and he i'm like oh can you show me how to, how you did that trick and he was like if you can get your double lift down then I'll teach you. <laughs> and it's, so you're like, it'll take maybe two or three months before he'll ever actually teach me the trick that I want to I learn. I remember hearing Nick Lewin tell a story of, uh, I can't remember who taught him the multiplying bottles, but he was uh, some big deal magician from over there, you know. Uh, and uh, and I remember Nick telling the story of sort of a similar thing. He was learning from this guy and uh, he had to just pace in the front room for like an hour, tossing up a shot glass and catching it without seeing it. You know, just to get that muscle memory. So as he learns the routine, he can be, you know, talking to the people and toss the shot glass, catch it, put it back on, you know, almost like flair bartending with this multiplied yeah. bottles. And, and you know what? It showed because Nick probably has the best multiplying bottles along with like a Denny Haney, you know, or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
it is like the karate kit of magic. <laughs> you're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Wax on, wax off. And then eventually you're it's, doing yeah. playing bottles. And it's like, oh, wow. Who knew? Yeah, I mean, anytime I get a new student, uh, I make them burn their hand with flash paper, like Fight Club. And then I go, <laughs> all right, now you've done it. Next. <laughs> nice. You don't want that the first time to be in front of an audience. You're like, oh, yeah, flash paper's been fine. Like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you focus one and one halfway across the room. Together, and you're going to fucking hold that thing. You're going to let it burn to the end and uh, burn burn your hand. And then you'll think twice next time. You want to make a dub appear with it or something. You know, you'll be more conscious. <laughs> Very true. When you were working with the dubs then, like – Starting off quite young, you were saying you had one dove. Was it hard to convince your parents that you were able to get a dove, or were they all for it? No, it wasn't that hard per se. Um, my, my my parents divorced when I was fairly young, so uh, uh, I think it kind of became uh, uh, a friendly a friendly battle, you know, between the parents. Well, I'll get him one dove. Well, why one? He can have four. You know. Oh well, then I guess we'll get four. You know. It, I think it kind of became some of that. But I also think it'd be, it, it was, um, uh, I, I mean, I think too, uh, I, I gotta give, I do have to give a shout out to my parents and my family in this sense, because, uh, I feel I was, uh, raised right, you know, in yeah. that I didn't, um, I didn't just get dubs, you know, I had one dove, I had to prove that I could handle the one dove and that I could care for the one dove and it wouldn't fall on the responsibility of, a parent or a brother or sister or or it would just become neglected you know um so i had to i had to sort of prove that and that you know and that's what led to me being allowed to have more you know then from one i got four from four it became six six became eight and then you know uh you know then then it just became a problem but uh, <laughs> but yeah you know it, it start it started like that you know that's um sort of what was put in my head <clears throat> from from a young age just in various forms too not even just magic it was just kind of how how i was raised you know just pretty much more so you know uh whatever you want to call it that you know uh that traditional i don't know i don't even know if you call it traditional american upbringing you know get up make your bed you know feed the animals you brush your teeth take your vitamins say your prayers get on the school bus you know yeah, yeah thank you it's good conduct, uh, you know, just just good morals and, and just, you know, being a good person, I guess, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like the uh, a, a dog isn't just for Christmas, that a dove can't go in your magic bottom drawer that you just put it in there. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I tried it, it wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah, I think everybody has tried livestock magic at least one time in their career to some degree, you know, they've. They either they bought the animal with the prop or they got the prop and they're stuffing tube socks in it to be like, oh, could I use this? And, you know, whether it's a rabbit, a dove, you know, people, I think guys experiment at least once to some degree or consider, you know. Yeah. So, so when did when did it um, become like a real career to you, Dan? When did you decide, you know, I could really be a professional, you know, globally? I didn't really uh, I didn't really decide. It just sort of unfolded. It was just something I kind of knew, you know. I had kind of made up my mind unofficially at uh, at a younger age, you know. Um, I didn't really have. I mean, I went to university and stuff at at my parents' request, mostly, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I, uh, and so I did that, and I had to move to to attend university, and so, man. All right, so it, it kind of went like this, right? So I've been doing magic, you know, growing up in Minnesota. I had my client base, right? Mm -hmm. But now it comes time to graduate, and I kind of knew I didn't want to, you know, as much as, you know, Minnesota is, is still my home and I go back every chance I get, uh, I, I, I knew I didn't want to stay in Minnesota. You know, I knew mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, the opportunities for me there were, would be limited. You know, the internet was very, uh, it, it, it wasn't new, but it, like YouTube wasn't really a thing yet, you know, uh, Facebook, social media wasn't really a thing yet. So the, the, the opportunity for exposure was better, but not what it is like today, you know? So, so, so with that in mind, and also with agreeing to apply to universities, uh, I, I, you know, I, it was down kind of between like, do I go to New York or where do I go? You know, and Chicago was the closest metropolis uh 
that I could go to, you know, it's only like a seven hour drive from the Twin Cities. So like a nine hour drive from where I lived, but I at least could get, you know, back to Minnesota where I had an agent still and stuff. Uh, you know, it, it was close enough. And I had friends in Chicago and uh, and I just liked the city. So that really kind of became like my second home for a number of years. And that's where it was at university there where I really decided, like, I know I'm going for this degree, but I don't think I'm ever going to use it professionally, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I had to start over. Right. I had to start over because I didn't have this client base anymore. So in order to start over, I, I knew like, boom, I, I had kind of gotten out of kid shows in Minnesota, right? But I knew like kid shows were always a dependable source for shows. Yeah. You know, everybody's having a birthday, libraries, school assemblies, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, you know, all those things, you know. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and and so I, I, I started trying to cycle back into that uh, genre. And so I did. And so I sort of, uh, re rebuilt my kid show to help me stand out more in in the big metropolis that was Chicago because I was kind of a small I uh, sorry I was kind of a big fish in a small pond in Minnesota yeah, right yeah so mm-hmm. uh, so what I would do is I would like during the day I'd be doing like daycares or you know uh, blue and gold banquets for scouts or libraries and then you know on the weekends I'd be doing birthday parties but then at night I'd get weird and go to like the golf clubs and like do the bird act or, or whatever, you know? So it's like, I had like a second life, but that's when I, um, that's when I really, I, I became within a year, pretty much full time doing kid shows. Essentially. That's how I made my, my money was doing kid shows. And, uh, and I was still, uh, getting booked to do the castle and I was doing some tours as well. Um, and uh, I actually dropped out of college a couple times to, to, to do to do these tours but thankfully i was on a partial scholarship so they were they were a little bit more lenient and kind about it thank goodness you know but it took me about 10 years to finally get the degree and i still have no idea where it is you know I don't <laughs> probably on the bottom of a dove cage somewhere i don't know <laughs> it does show the good upbringing as well with the parents being like oh you have to have the degree because who knows what's going to happen this magic thing it's always handy to have something to fall back on especially from a parent's mind looking at their kid being like oh it's like a kid saying they want to be an astronaut or a princess when they're really younger it's like yeah well let's right. see how yeah. we can go first you probably have a better chance of becoming a princess than an astronaut yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially with my math skills i don't think they'll let me anywhere near <laughs> anywhere near nasa <laughs> it wouldn't go well right well, yeah. when you were developing rack then you're talking that you did the makeup oh, yeah, for uh, is there, there, my, my garbage uh, my garbage man is here. Sorry, it's super loud. I got the window open. It's okay. He's just... Uh, yeah. I, I just got sent a box of all this, uh, you know, magic to review that Jabrizi put out. So uh, I filed it in a special folder this morning. And it's getting taken away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, that didn't happen. But <laughs> <there's> <laughs> a bunch of <laughs> They'd, they'd be interesting reviews, all right, definitely. <laughs> definitely. When, when you were saying you started off doing the like makeup for the horror movies as a kid, and then you started wearing basic makeup around the eyes and stuff on stage, and then to the point now where it's like pretty full on, how did that develop? And is it still developing, or are you happy where it is? Uh, I mean, it's kind of still developing. I kind of go through like phases, you know, where like I just, I never really have ever had like a set design i guess set design of what i put on my face it's usually just kind of making shit up as i go along or whatever and uh and then uh i mean it 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 evolved i mean it started when i was a teenager you know kind of like you said it slowly started kind of creeping in right but that that came with me feeling comfortable to be able to do it and that came with uh, the comfortability came with uh, as my sort of like resume, I guess you could say as, as my resume expanded, it, mm. it allowed that I, I felt it allowed me to do that more and made it easier for it to be accepted. Whereas if I were to, you know, if I was, you know, 16 and showing up to a, the local Wells Fargo bank Christmas party, you know, which, which is an example of a gig that I would do. I couldn't, you know, show up, you know, looking like I just came out of, you know, uh, Misfits or something, you know, okay. 
Um, because it just, I yeah. couldn't, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't justify the price I was asked because there would be immediate um, judgment, you know, or concern, you know, call for yeah. concern. Um, whereas as my resume grew, I started feeling I could allow more of who I was off stage to sneak into my performances on stage because mm-hmm. as I was able to say, you know, performed at the Magic Castle, been on tour here, there, and everywhere, just got done doing whatever. You know, some of these bullet points I felt allowed that, oh, well, if he did that, well, then he must, then that it must be good and interesting and, oh, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um and so yeah. that's um, that's kind of when when it started creeping on. Also, I, I had done some magic competitions and stuff when I was younger, and that was also a phase where I I felt I, w- I was creating material because I I felt I had to whether I believed what the judges were saying or not. I felt I had to in order to place or even get an award because I was under the misinformation of. You build an act, you get like a Lance, you know, like what Lance did or something. You get the act, you get the gig, then you can build the repertoire to the next level, to the bu- and and it just doesn't really, it didn't really work that way anymore, even when I was doing it, you know, and it certainly doesn't work that way now, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was too focused on on a solid 10 instead of a solid 45, you know what I mean? So yeah. mm-hmm. so as as I started caring less about winning the contest because I, I didn't really win that many. I, ne- I, I I lost to, you know, like Ashley Springer who was doing a gumball machine act, you know, yeah. which just, which I found just annoying as hell because like I was trying to do like, like, you know, the bird act and manipulation with gloves on. And here I'm like, this fucker is just pulling sponge balls out of a fucking gumball machine. What the <laughs> fuck? You know? And, and other shit, you know, oh, isn't that cute? The, the, the eight-year-old kid put his six-year-old sister in the Temple of Benares and stuck swords through it. Isn't that cute? You know, <laughs> let's give him the award. You know, like, what? How much fucking skill is in that? You know, but anyway, so, like, this is stuff, you know, that I didn't understand. But as, as I continued to lose, uh, I actually started getting hired by these conventions that had the competitions in them, right? So mm-hmm. now coming back, I wasn't a competitor. I was a showcaser, you know? So now it was sort of like, well, now that I'm being paid to be here, now I can do kind of what I usually do or what I want to do. And, and that sort of allowed and justified. And as that grew, as I worked the castle more, as I started working Vegas more, as I started working more internationally, uh, having more TV credits and stuff, that just sort of allowed uh, me to get away with it a bit more, I guess you could say, you know? So, yeah, uh, it's funny that you mentioned yeah. the, um, the the conventions and stuff because I remember early on in my career, I've been at a convention and a competition with you know torn jeans and my 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 style wouldn't be as rocker as as your style, but it would be slightly rocker, part time rocker and um, and uh, torn jeans and a t shirt and they were like, oh no, I mean it doesn't fit the act and I did a, a really solid act, but I I lost to a guy doing the pecan fucking trick, so I know exactly what you mean, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. got out the look. I bet he was eight too, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's those bloody eight year olds. The it's craziest the skill you can you ever see. They're, they're changing color and shrinking and growing. And, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was just a really shit one by like a guy that was semi retired. <laughs> <laughs> that just means he's got the work on that beacon. He's been doing yeah, it. That's a fact. Yeah, 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 a lifetime of beacon, yeah. That, see, this is what I'm saying. You, you, you don't see many guys that got that lifetime work on shit anymore. It's just not a thing, you know? It's true. It's true. One of the things I really like actually watching uh, you, some of the stuff you've done on TV, especially uh, I remember in the Penn and Teller Fulos, where you're doing interacting with Alison. And it's like from a visual point of view, it's like a horror character. But what I really like is like the innocence of the character, like playing with your hair and just like, almost shy while being so out there i really like that like character twist was that something you've always tried to have in it or is that something that's just developed uh yeah i mean that sort of developed as as i got comfortable talking and learning how to talk you know because initially as i was coming out i i didn't like how i talked right because especially with like the look 
being on stage with, uh, you know, the look and everything and all the makeup and stuff, I never, I never liked how, how I talked. And for a long time, I would, uh, I, I would, I would, I would change how I talked stuff. Cause I thought, you know, it just sounded like, like I was from the movie Fargo or something, you know, but yeah. yet looking like this meth clown or whatever, like it just, yeah. what the hell? It didn't make sense. Yeah. I didn't like it. And so I never felt comfortable talking. And it was uh, some, you know, some other guys like Paul Kozak, who really uh, has been like one of my best friends uh, in and out of magic for years. He, he really helped me learn to talk, you know, and uh, by giving me a, a free reign to do pretty much all of his material uh, because we kind of came from the same background, I guess, even though we look different, we had a lot of similar backgrounds and, 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 and attracted to similar things, I guess, you know, um, yeah, so, so cool. Kozak was, was big on that and, and Jeff Hobson was another guy because we both worked in shows here in Vegas backstage and you know, kind of how it is, uh, you, you know, it, it is kind of like the, the guy's locker room back there. You just shit talk each other the whole time, <laughs> you know, cause you got to work seven days a week with these guys. You know, we, we were working Vegas seven days a week no days off like ever right so you're you're with these guys every day and so you just kind of inadvertently become this weird foster family so you just shit talk each other backstage and you know take the piss and all that right so uh so in that and 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 in that you know they uh they started saying like gee why don't you talk on stage you should be doing this which i never which i never want to do and i never liked because too <clears throat> even silently Although I was uh, an M, you know, influenced and more so attracted to applying, maybe you know, this shock or gore or horror type stuff to magic. Being a fan of magic and and respecting the art of magic from a young age, uh, I I understand and feel, in my opinion, that 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 there sh there should still be wonder and and it should mm -hmm. still be. There should still be a, 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 for lack of a better term, a moment of magic that 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 sends that wonder, that amazement, that how you know, and yeah. and I don't want the the gore or the or any of that stuff to overshadow that, and I don't want it to be about that. That's not that's a side effect of the journey, you know. Yeah. We're, we're we're trying to get to Disney World. You probably got car sick on the drive, but we're still gonna get there, you know. Um, we're, we're <laughs> nice. and, so, uh, and, and so, and so with that too, there's, and I'm not, I mean, I'm just going to say this as a fact, cause I've seen it. There's been guys I've toured with. There's been guys who, and it, cause it just happens. Uh, there's, there's been, I've been ripped off, you know, there's guys that, that, mm -hmm. that, that have, uh, that have ripped me off, ripped off posture lines, you know, the bits that mm -hmm. are, that are built and, and most of the time, guys that steal, they don't understand why things work. You guys have probably seen it before where someone steals a line or they'll steal a bit. They see the reaction, but they don't understand why it works, you know, why it worked yeah. for that person. Yeah. So I made, when I started talking, for example, I made a conscious decision to honestly try to be genuinely who I am and allow things that I like and that I'm influenced by and that I'm into to create a, a sort of semi-narrative along the along the show or the act or however, however long of a time I'm doing, and so I don't I never wanted any line or any bit to to come from anywhere. I, I wanted it to where I want if if the magic can't be truly original, I want to try to be as as original and true to myself as possible. And with that came lines and things that I naturally say and things that have come out of the routine, and that is stemmed from also being the the victim as well so like i have to be a victim or i have to be relatable you know yeah mm -hmm. initially it could be scary but i have to somehow uh, in a way connect with everybody you know try yeah. to find a way to connect with grandma and grandpa to make them maybe say you know he reminds me of uh, he reminds me of our little of our little Tommy, you know, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, or yeah. or the, or or if there's kids, you know, ah, oh, he reminds me of a comic book character or or whatever, you know. Still have to uh, be vulnerable, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, I still have yeah. to be vulnerable, so I can't I can't be a powerhouse shoving freaky crazy shocking stuff 
down the audience's throat and in their face. There, you have to have a break and a release of that tension. And mm -hmm. and usually, you know, humor is, is a great way to release it. And if there's gonna be humor, uh, I I try to make it something that's self-deprecating because I'm just an easy target, obviously, you know. So uh, so self-deprecating in 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 as much of a of a way as possible. Because for example, like with the Allison thing, you know, I got I mean I still get a lot of heat for that routine where, you know, people are just well, I think also because it's 2020, everybody's offended by something. Nobody can have fun anymore. But like even, you know, like uh like grabbing her finger and shoving it in my eye and and her recoiling, that what people don't understand is that's actually me physically pushing her finger away but it looks like it's recoiling you know like little like it, she looks like she's pulling away but it's actually me like it's like i'm you know it's like i'm raymond crow with a zombie ball you know like yeah, a, you know yeah, yeah. McBride with the mask you know like transformation and stuff and so like you know uh so it's you know it's pantomime in that but it's 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 still an illusion so it's it's creating that that illusion and and making it con convincing, but maintaining control over over the whole situation. I got off on a tangent, but hopefully that that answers your question. I mean, it, it was conscious, but, I, but I'm very calculated because I, I in the end I I want to maintain a respect for the person on stage. I mean, I've had people cry on stage. I've had the whole thing. You know, I've had wet kills. That's usually when they piss themselves. You know, uh, and uh, you know all that stuff. And, and you, you have to um, be able to con control that. And it's, it's almost like screwing up a trick because there are times with stuff I do, even in the, the, the gothiest of goth clubs or mm. tattooiest of tattoo conventions I've worked, you'd be surprised there are still people that, 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 that freak out, even though you, no matter how much you say this isn't real. This, it's just a magic trick. You know, there's so many times where I, I'll have to mute my mic and lean in and say, like, look, it's not real. Just just go along with it. Here's what's going to happen. You know, da, 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 da. you know, whatever. Like, I have to talk them off the cliff. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that, you know, and that's something that I think people need to be aware of. Not even if you're just doing, you know, shock magic or whatever. You know, the respect of your audience member is always number one, you know, yeah. regardless of, of the... How, how, whether, like I said, regardless of where you're, you know, you're shock, you know, you're doing crazy shock stuff like I am, you know, I mean, like me, but hopefully not my material, but, uh, you know, um, or, or even if you're doing a, I mean, maybe a second sight act where inadvertently you're, you, you find yourself answering questions about a dead relative and then the person starts crying, you know, you gotta, you yeah. gotta know how to control and uh and 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 play off those emotions but but try to try to maintain control i guess yeah you're trying to keep the you know respect for the audience and, and keep it you know as as kind of you know human and and have a you know not just about like ego and making you look good because you can make someone cry but thinking about a dead relative i mean that's that's kind of a given but you have seen we have we've all seen performers you know kind of milk those scenarios to make them look all powerful you know mm -hmm. oh yeah I mean, there was one, uh, there was one dude, Luke, I'll just fucking say it. I don't give a shit who it is. So Luke Germain was doing a show here in Vegas, right? Before he got in trouble and fled the country. And so uh, he was doing his mentalism show. And uh, this is years ago. This is over 10 years ago. And, uh, and she was my, my fiance at the time, I guess you could say. Uh, without going too far into it, her brother had just had a, uh, a, a, a medical condition thing happen. And, uh, but we went to the show. Anyways, that night, and we were a bit late because we were dealing with this, and uh, Luke's, uh, it was Ben Seidman. I remember Ben Seidman was Luke's little little fake Kenner, right? Like, running around and, you know, pre-showing and all the bullshit. And, uh, and I remember we were like, yo, sorry, we're late, whatever. We were dealing with this, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, my God, like, hope, uh, like, hope he's okay and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's all good, it's all good. Looking forward to the show, blah, blah. We sit, right? Come sign to Luke doing his second sight act. And he goes, oh, I think uh, someone over here had a uh, had a had a relative that just had a medical condition today. And I was just like, motherfucker, like you ass, like, dude, now you're going to make me or her fucking stand up and have to be like, oh, yeah, Jesus, how'd you know? Oh, my God. Like, fuck off, dude. Like, that was just the fucking like, 
did no, you had like a hundred people really nobody scribbled something more interesting on it you know on the fucking paper like you had to fucking play that game like that just that sorry that seemed cheap to me but you know that kind of shit like cheap shots that uh trying to capitalize i'm i don't know i'm just not into that maybe my randy's showing a bit i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah it's just like you were saying about like stock lines and people taking lines that are you know primarily yours or, or certain have you ever come across someone who's like try to take your whole look and demeanor because i mean it, it does happen like a ukrainian piff yeah ukrainian <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's ukrainian piff a guy yeah. went on like uh, Ukraine's Got Talent and did Piff the Magic Dragons and Tyra Act. Really? Perfect. Yeah. With, like with a different... dog that's like a two-headed dragon just because his dog has like Chernobyl fallout like fucking growth. Yeah, he, he, he changed it to a hamster because he said chihuahuas are out of style. <laughs> so, this guy sounds like an asshole. Yeah, he got called out by one of the judges, so that was that was nice. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, mean, I, um, I mean, yeah, I, you know, well, here's the thing. Like, I, I wasn't the first one to wear eyeliner and lipstick on stage. So, like, it's not my, you know, it's, it's not my stamp, you know. Mm-hmm. So, it's like, whatever, uh, you know. But, like, um, yeah, I mean, like, even, like, the Lifesaver thing, for example, you know, at, at the core of it, that's not mine. But that's my routine with it, you know. So, mm-hmm. like, if people are using my my floss box handling and the magic moments music and then add in the mojo and the moves and all that. Yeah. That starts to get a little, that, that, that upsets me a little bit, you know, but I mean, I, yeah, I've had, if not the whole look, I mean, uh, I saw you guys had Joe Myers on, uh, yeah. like about six years ago, he, he, he had lifted, uh, my roulette routine and my video guy released a side by side. Joel took it down. Cause you know, God punished him. But like, uh, you know, but I mean, shit like that pops up and it's, I mean, Joel's been a repeat offender, so he should have known better. But like, there's times like that where like, I have seen stuff and, you know, sometimes like, okay, a dude, uh, a dude hit me up about helping him with his act, you know, with like to be a student and, and stuff. And, uh, he, he, he was from, uh, India. I think he was from India. I remember. And, uh, and he had sent me a, you know, a thing where he, he basically said like, yeah, I'm doing your act. It's going great, you know, or whatever. And it's like, dude, you don't do that. That is not okay, you know. Uh, you you don't you don't hit up Celine Dion and say, you know, I I just got you know I, I'm killing it with my heart will go on. Like I'm just <laughs> like fucking nailing it to the cross with this. Like you, not a dry eye in the fucking house, you know. And so like you know you just don't do that. And now with this guy, you know, he's younger and. And, and, you know, I, I don't, this isn't like, I know I say a lot of shit, but it, it's coming from just a place of, of, of observation and opinion. But uh, that being said, he, you know, being from India, I think also just culturally and magically and stuff, they, 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 they don't necessarily have the same standards, you know? So it, that stuff happens a lot. I'm not saying it's excusable, but I think maybe they just weren't, they just aren't being necessarily... I, I use the term raised a lot. They just, they aren't being raised in magic. They aren't coming up in magic, you know, the right way. And, and usually, you know, so like I kind of, depending on where the person's from, I kind of have a little bit more of like a, a leniency, I guess, you know, an age, you know, is another thing. Experience is another thing because a lot of people when they're starting out, you know, I, I think it's, it's inevitable when you're starting out, you're going to, whether you mean to or not, you're going to borrow, you know, you're going to borrow. But the thing is, is, is outgrowing that and adapting and, and, and finding your voice, you know, Rudy Kobe has a great thing in his first set of lecture notes uh, where he basically says, go buy linking rings and just go do shows, go hide in plain sight, go do nursing home shows, just get out there, just go to, even if you're not getting paid, donate to donate times to like a kid's home or something. And go do shit like Linking Rings or Die Box or Stratosphere and work it so much to where you'll you'll know, is this for me? Is it not? But if it is, it will evolve. You'll start finding your voice. You'll find the music you want to use or you'll find, mm-hmm. you know, it, you just chew it up and you spit it out. Chew it up, spit it out until you figure out what's going to work, you know. So, uh, so I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I mean, when I when I started out, I thought I was I wanted to be Neil Foster and Joseph Gabriel. You know, like, and Cardini, you know, I was doing 
Carpen Imp with, with gloves on, top hat, came to table, you know, white doves and, and, and all that. And uh, and so, you know, I You've think it's a little bit, so just a small tweak from the yeah, top hat and gloves. <laughs> that, so with that, like, for example, with this kid, I you know, I just laid it out for him. I just said, like, look, dude, like, you, you can't be doing that. Not cool. Um, take down the video or we're going to have a problem, you know. And uh, and he was cool about it, you know. Like I think, to some degree, I think a lot of people uh, knee jerk reaction too much, you know. Like, oh, you stole that from Norm Nielsen. Go to hell, you motherfucker. You know, whatever. Like, <laughs> I, think, I think I think there there needs to be uh, initially at least uh, an an effort to educate and to help, you know. But yeah. but there is also there's there's also just lost causes, you know, like Ukrainian piff or whatever, like. Yeah. You should know better, you know. I, I, mean, I like, think it's like, down to the brick and mortar stores we were talking about and magic clubs where people aren't getting the advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. Instead, <clears throat> everyone thinks, and it, it comes into like one of the questions we got sent in uh, earlier is when you're talking about like tweaking your the, the tricks you're doing. Someone, uh, Chris asked, how do you know when a routine is ready for stage? So I think it's especially people who go from close up to stage with close up, you can practice on friends, but with a stage routine, it's very hard not to just practice yeah. without an audience. Yeah, yeah. Stage is a different beast, you know. Um, and 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 I'm not saying this to like shit on close up guys or whatever, but I think I, I think guys transitioning from stage to close up is much easier than mm -hmm. guys transitioning from close up to stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so with that in mind, uh, as far as a routine ready for stage uh I, I i think it just it varies you know honestly you know kind of like what you said you can rehearse as much yeah. as you like till your heart is content but until you go out there and really start to listen to the audience you know and and start to like i was saying chew it up and spit it out it's never it's never ready to be on stage you know what i mean it's never stage yeah. ready. It's like, it's what's your level of good enough, you know? And I mean, there's been times where I've been backstage and just been like, yeah, I'm pissing around with this. Fuck it, I'm just gonna throw that in the act. Let's see what happens, you know? Yeah. And there's been other times where I've worked on shit for months, come to do it live for a show and I get cold feet and I go, I'm not, fuck, I'm, I'm not ready as I thought I was, you know? Hey, we're, we're cutting the fucking, blah, 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 you know? Like, yeah. whatever, you know? Um, and uh, hope Q Lab's ready, you know, or something, you know, like as we're we're moving on. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, it just it just depends, really, and uh, yeah. and it comes and and I think it comes down to as well being able to uh, stand by for 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 humiliation and failure, you know, especially if you're doing a bit, because um, certain stage routines. Uh, I think, and, and close up to a degree to, to some point, but imagine like, you know, a silent stage routine and something goes horribly wrong. Like, you know, your, your, your load falls out too early and, you know, whatever, you know, um, I, I can't think of an example. The, the thread breaks and yeah. how do you kill two minutes? You know, if you're doing, you know, a close up ambitious card, oh, you just move along, you know? You're on stage and and you're you know you're doing this for the next two minutes you know like what do you do you know so you have to it's it's a completely different kind of exercise you know in terms of trying to think like like you mentioned chess it's almost like a chess game you're you're having to think you know maybe traditionally in magic you you try to always stay two steps ahead I think in stage especially in like you know stage manipulation stage illusions whatever you almost have to be six to eight steps ahead because God forbid you know. You, you yeah. gotta, you know, you gotta be able to pull it back around, come full circle, you know, whatever, you know, get back on track. You, you learn from experience it. too, I think. Like when you forget, yeah. like if when something goes wrong, you'll always make sure. Like uh, I do a lot of mentalism on stage, so if I I now know that I need to have an extra peak wallet in my pocket because you never know, the impression yeah. might fail, the person might change their mind, and you're like, right. yeah, that's how you exactly. learn. What can go wrong will go wrong. That's always the rule of thumb, you know. What I mean, I, I like 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 Dave does mentalism, but I do a lot of escapes and stunts and things. I mean, always have an extra of everything, you know what I mean? Because you never know what could go wrong on the night, something or break, whatever. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. No, I mean, I, uh, I, I've never been a believer in a perfect show, you know? No. Like the guys, oh, how'd it go? Oh, fucking killed it, man. <laughs> killed it. Killed it. I'm just like, no, you didn't. Uh, no, you didn't. I don't believe you. There obviously something happened. What did you learn? Like something, you know, even if it's like, yeah. ah, the mic batteries died, you know, 10 minutes before the end. Well, now, you know, change the battery. There's always something to learn from, you know, it's, yeah. the, it's the guys that are like, nailed it, killed it. Oh my God, blew him away. Had him in the palm of my hand. It's like, okay, we're not friends. We're not going <laughs> to. And the audience are like, yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah, 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 right. You're so full of shit. <laughs> it's fucking delusional. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the whole thing with trying out new stuff, I even find sometimes, like, with close-up or some stage stuff, me and Steve would be talking about this new routine that we're going to try out, and then after the gig, they go, oh, how did it go? Did you do it? Like, not did the same old shit. <laughs> Didn't feel right. Same old shit. Yeah. Not, it's not happening. Yeah. Do you mind with the silent stuff, like, especially doing the doves earlier? Because I saw you were on France's Got Talent and things like that. Did you find that a lot more easier to do? Because I do have them magic moment song stuck in my head because I was watching that uh, audition video <laughs> earlier. It just doesn't go away. Yeah. It's the in there, man. Now you're infected. Yeah, it doesn't go away. But did you find that it does help internationally having a silent aspect to act or just an entire silent act? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah sort of. But really, I mean, so many places speak English. You know, like I do a lot in Germany, right? Yeah. And... Uh, a, a big, big part of my fan base is 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 in that you know, Germany, Austria area. Mm -hmm. You know, German yeah. speaking, yeah. I guess you could say. And uh, and although you know, I I do speak German. It's almost like you know, my my German isn't fluent. So that it's almost like they're like just fucking say it in English, you know. And <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's fucking fine, you know. Or. Uh, you know, or like I, I took a, a, a page out of uh, Cyril's lecture where when he was blowing up like uh, in, in Japan, you know, when he was doing all his street magic specials and stuff, <laughs> he can speak Japanese, but he, he intermixes the English with the Japanese because it makes it interesting, you know, it makes it yeah. intriguing. You know? So I started I, I started I borrowed, you know, that from his lecture and, we, and was doing that a lot. So, you know, there if you can learn a little bit. It's 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 usually it's cool, and then you know you just go on with speaking English, you know, or something. Because uh, really, like if I've done other, you know, other shows, if it's not even if it's not on TV, let's say, I mean, internationally, that's they, still English is still fine. And because mm -hmm. magic is so uh, visual, I uh, I feel it's you know you can still get from A to B to C. I mean, just just watch Renee Levon. It's like I don't know what the fuck he's saying, but I get it. You know, I see what's yeah. going on here. You know, yeah, that's very true. It's it's, it's international language magic is one hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you find it tough on like the Francis Got Talent where they're giving you feedback in like fluent French? And I I saw sometimes you were just like, mm, interesting. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> or it's like, is are I, they being well, nice? <laughs> I, I don't take any of that shit seriously, anyways. Yeah. You know. It's, a fucking contest show and I'm paid to be there anyway. So I know I'm going home. It doesn't matter. Say whatever you want. I don't care. You know, like, so, uh, so no, that didn't matter. And actually there was a judge on the France got talent there. One of the judges was a magician who is hmm. notorious for stealing shit. And, uh, and at one point he was trying to talk to me about, uh, how he did a dove act. And he's basically explaining to me, the Eric Buss dub act that Eric Buss used to do where he would take his clothes off. Like it was called after the gig. So the, the whole theme of the act was Eric was coming back to his apartment after the gig. And as he's taking his clothes off, uh, it just shit starts appearing out of nowhere, you know? And, uh, and, and it, it was essentially a dub act at, at the core, but he would produce a rabbit and, you know, shit was just coming out of all sorts of places. Right. And, and this judge of France got talent, Starts describing, oh, you know, look, I, I don't, I don't even do a good French accent, so we give you shit. <laughs> but like, you know, uh, if, if I do do a French accent, it sounds like Monty Python. So we'll just, if you guys have any French listeners, I'm sorry, but, um, but, uh, but you know, he's, he's basically telling me this act that he does, and I'm like, fucker, that's my buddy's act, and uh, I don't really give a shit what you're saying, anyways, you know. Um, and also because, like, I mean, with all the respect to, 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 to the French. They, they were very French at times, you know, there was, it was, I, I've worked France a lot 
and uh, and they weren't and they weren't rude, but they, they were French, you know. Yeah. And so, like, obviously, I don't even know if this made air because I never watched the the show. But at one point, they were trying to talk to me in French, and they I knew they fucking knew I didn't speak French, you know. And yeah. so they think they're getting one over, and you know the fucking translators telling me all this bullshit, and uh, and I just responded to him in German, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this, he'd be speaking German if it wasn't for me historically. So, you know, I'm the, she's just like, the just finish the thing, like, good night, Berlin. <laughs> just walk <laughs> off, right? Yeah, but uh, but no, I mean, for the most part, though, I mean, that was just that, that was one uh, you know, example, but no, for the most part, I, I mean, it, like I was saying, it is such an international language and stuff, and and uh. And in the end, you know, stuff like that, they just want to make, they're just there to make good TV and, and make up the drama, you know, make, make up the drama. Now, on, on the Patrick Sebastian show, though, when I did that one, you know, the, the, the Grand Plus Cabaret, Dumont, whatever that yeah. show is called, right? I did, I, I did my act there uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I remember they, they, uh, they, they wanted to, you know, do like a rehearsal, right? And, uh, and, and I was doing the bird act. And now these aren't my birds. So I, I have to go a little bit slower and I'm, you know, taking it easy with these guys because I'm just getting to know them, right? Yeah. So I, I wasn't ready when they were like, you know, uh, okay, uh, you know, rehearsal at three, be our guest, you know, or whatever. And so I was, I was late, right? Because I was getting everything ready. So I get out there and uh, actually Jean-Luc Bertrand was there. Really great French uh, magician. Has a really great show, The Magic Box. Really great show. Um, and, uh, and so, um, I was there, right? So I'm there getting ready. Jean-Luc came later, but he wasn't there for this part. And I remember I'm getting ready and I was late to be on stage. And, you know, they're all like, oh, just, oh, this is late. This is so rude, you know? And, uh, oh, it's American. Oh, pff, American. You know, like they thought I was like some fucking asshole American, <laughs> like being a dick. And I'm like, oh, okay, motherfuckers. So comes time to film. If you watch it, comes time to film for the TV show. Instead of putting all my shit in in the box, you know, receptacle for the act, I just threw it all on the fucking floor, and then got a standing ovation, which isn't hard. Anybody on Laplace gets a fucking standing ovation. That doesn't mean shit. But so afterwards, you know, boom, the camera cuts, and I just stood there and made the fucking crew come and pick my shit up. You know, <laughs> not like I, I hope, like I'm not saying like I think I'm a diva, but it's just like motherfucker, never forget. Like you, you want to talk some shit, like I'll I'll give you something to talk shit about if you want to play that game. You know. <laughs> Pick up my shit. <laughs> the only way you could have, the only way you could have popped that is if you just threw a, a, a fucking TV into the audience or something. I don't pure get it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the other another question we got sent in was from David David Doyle. Uh, how do you get into a creative mindset? Was the, the question. So uh, like, you, you do come up with some creative stuff as we're saying, changing the tricks. Like even when you do saw in the neck or the tread out the eye, it's so different to how a lot of other people are doing it. So uh, what's like your creative process, I guess? Shit. Yeah. It's just got deep. Yeah. That's you know, a tough question. It is a tough question. And it's not really one. I don't think there's really uh, one answer, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's definitely something you can't force, you know? Yeah. It's really something you can't force, uh, and and I think that patience, I guess, uh, patience is is how I really uh, try to uh, handle the creative process, I guess, for lack of a better term, because it's it's always different, but it could come from anywhere. Where it could be a song, you know, like a, a song that you hear. And it's just, I don't know what I'm going to use this for. I could see it. It could be for a zigzag. Maybe I could do a, a whatever, a, you know, a miser's dream to this. I don't know. You know, I'm just throwing out shit. But, you know, uh, but but I don't know exactly what I'm going to use it for. Or it could be a bit like I've always wanted to do. Like I went through this during the pandemic. Here's an example. I went through this during the pandemic. I, I always loved a good zombie ball routine, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and this came from years ago when I was on tour with Mark Kalin. And uh, he, he loves old magic. So we would always sit on the bus and talk 
like old magic shit, you know, like old props, you know, what did you see in the catalog? Well, and I remember one time we had said, what's one, what's one trick that most people like dismiss or they, they, it, you know, it, it's been lost to the ages or whatever, but mm -hmm. one, one that you wish maybe you invented or that you had worked on or whatever, you know, and I can't remember what he said, but I said like zombie ball. Like I had, I'd always loved zombie. I'd had one when I was a kid, never really used it, you know, but uh, you know, seeing, you know, guys like Norm had a great zombie ball, even though it wasn't a zombie ball. It was still great. Um, yeah. There was a guy named Todd. Todd, I, I can't remember his last name. Uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was a younger dude, popped really, really big, got over in like the mid 90s, but then like kind of disappeared. But he did a really great zombie with a chandelier, like like a like a three candle chandelier. Um, I remember there was a guy named Mark Bond out of Wisconsin. He's passed away now. Probably, in my opinion, the best zombie ball. He had some moves that I don't know what, like, Tommy Wonder, sorry, dude, you're number two now. You know, I'm sure they're up there talking about it anyways. But, like, you know, really great stuff. And so um, I'd always wanted to work on a zombie, and I, I, I had heard of a story uh, that's that's kind of based on extraterrestrials and conspiracy theories and stuff, which is a whole nother can of worms that I'm interested in, which I won't go into. We won't turn this into Joe Rogan, but <laughs> like, uh, but there's a story that that I heard and was studying years ago, and I remember saying, "Holy shit!" Like, if I ever did a zombie ball, this is this was this is how I would narrate. This would be the vehicle of why I would do zombie ball because I knew I didn't because uh, I knew I wanted to do it traditionally. You know, I didn't want to have, I wanted a zombie ball. I didn't want it to be like Lance had the birdcage. Norm had the violin. This guy Todd had the chandelier. You know, I wanted something, you know, uh, uh, interesting, but I wanted it to be a zombie ball, like traditional through and through. And so this story, I remember thinking like, holy shit, like, that's it. That's what I'm going to work on the zombie. Or that's the story I'm going to work on with the zombie. And then just never had time. And then, you know, uh, then this thing happened and, uh, and suddenly we all have a lot of time on our hands. And I, I went to work on the, on the zombie ball, you know, and that's, so that came, but again, even this is an idea that I've had in my mind and wanted to work on for like years, but it, like even getting back to like the song, like going through music, you know, and, and what's weird is we are talking about like, like, guys borrowing or stealing stuff you know whatever like I'm, I'm very protective of my material but i get really really defensive of music for some reason you know like because music is is almost it's so important and and can and can honestly make or break you know a routine you know what i mean like like you like copperfield do an elevator to phil collins you know, or, or yeah, Genesis, yeah. whichever whichever band that maniac was in at the time. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you, you hear that song. Like, you can't think of any other song with Elevator. You know, like, Copperfield's yeah, yeah. not going to use, you know, Van Halen, you know, jump to appear in the Elevator. It's just not a thing. You know, like, a song can make it break. So if you, you know, yeah, yeah. finding that, that, that song that just fits, you know, can can yeah, really yeah. bring it to the next level, and then you know you, you you know, and then some dude is is using it in sub trunk or something. It's like, dude, I know you don't know who that band is, because <laughs> I grew up with those guys, and they've been broken up for years. The guy has four kids, divorced twice, and now he works at UPS. I know you don't know who this fucking band is, you know, like <laughs> shit like that. Like it's like that stuff sets me off a bit, but I mean, but really, yeah. Uh, anyways, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, the, the music, I think, is, is important, but don't, yeah, no, don't force it. And, uh, and I've never really like sat down, like jam. Like I always see, I don't know if you guys jam. I've never been able to jam, you know, like I've been over at guys places like years ago and stuff. Like, Hey, why don't you come over? Let's jam, you know, bring some, you know, bring some stuff. Let's jam. I just, I can't jam. I've never been able to jam. You know, it always comes in the weirdest times. You know, I, I'm on an airplane. Or, or I'm in the shower, you know, um, uh, or, or whatever, you know, usually yeah. I'm at the bar, you know, I bring my notebook, I have a little notebook and, uh, and, you know, uh, I'll just, there, there's, there's a little dive bar by my warehouse now. And, and I, and if I'm, you know, waiting for paint to dry 
or I'm clamping some stuff, doing a repair and the, waiting for the glue to dry or whatever. I'll just, you know, I'll just go and have a drink and just, you know, just jot things, you yeah. know, if, as they come to mind or, you know, I, I always have a list, you know, there's a list of stuff that you know, still hasn't been worked on, but something might click, you know, I might just for whatever reason, it, it just comes out of nowhere. I don't know how to, how to describe it, but that's why I think like, like the patience thing, because I've, I've tried to force stuff like meet a deadline, you know, like, Oh man, I got a show coming up. I, I wanted to put that in for the show. And, and I've, I've, you know, I've thrown it in, you know, kind of like I was saying earlier, you know, chewed up, spit it out. I've thrown it in where it certainly hasn't been ready, you know, and, uh, and, and it eats a big pile of dog shit, you know, and then it's like, <laughs> needs a shop day, bring it back, needs a shop day, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I hope some of these answers are, are helpful because they're, they're not really, I don't really have direct answers for a lot of stuff. Well, that's just it. Like, with what, what a what a creative streak like that, or something. It is hard. I mean, you can't get inspiration from anything. It could be a scene in a movie, or it could be a character, or or something that's just from your childhood that actually might have happened or didn't happen, or a story or whatever. So, when creativity yeah. like that, it, you can't, you can never force it. I know for the times where I've had to meet deadlines for a certain stunt or whatever, and it has to be a certain way. But if you force it, it, it never becomes that kind of organic, raw feeling. Just disappears when you force it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I used to work a lot of. Um... I don't know if you guys have this market over there or not so much, but here in the States, like uh, the fair and festival market is a big market. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to work that market a lot and it's basically, you know, there'd be like a County fair or a state fair or something. And they usually go between three days to 10 days even, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and during that run, sometimes you, you get booked for the whole run, let's say, or maybe you're there for one day, but on average, you're doing two to three shows a day, 30 to 45 minutes, you're out in the elements, you know, on average, your stage is like some bales of hay and wood, you know, plywood put on top of it. And they're doing like a pie eating contest on there, you know, five minutes before you go on. So you don't really have time to preset, you know, there's wind go, you know, and so, you know, in, in, in a run, you know, if you're doing like a, like a 10 day run and you're doing two to three shows a day, you know, you're, you're getting some good work in the, in the, you know, uh, work on material in that mm -hmm. fair season, you know? So um, one thing that I used to do a lot was I would pick one or two things that I knew I would want to work on and, and get, if not to a point of pure perfection to where it's a bit or a routine that I want in my repertoire all the time, at least get it to a place where I can confidently put it in and have it in my back pocket given a situation could arise where if I can't do a B I can you I can do routine C you know just expanding my repertoire like a weird example was silk and egg and toss out deck right so I you know easy bulletproof routines which is something that I always tried to do with the fair and festival shows because you basically have to roll bulletproof you know your yeah. angles are bad you're on the elements you gotta roll bulletproof right so like one season uh, silk to egg and toss out deck was two of the things that I wanted to work on. Now I know I I know I have a solid uh, silk to egg routine, and I know I can do a solid toss out deck. Are they fucking groundbreaking original? Like I'm gonna win fism with it? No, but it's 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 at a level of of solidarity to where I can comfortably present it in a commercial sense in a gig or whatever if need be. So creative process, that's a different way of going about it. You know, like knowing like, all right. And, and trust me, those two routines were off the shelf basic. Like, like I said, I don't really jam. I don't really write material, you know, I just yeah. kind of just let it flow. And so for the first, you know, two runs or two gigs with, you know, doing silk and egg and toss out deck as part of the show, it, they were they were terrible and they were maybe a two minute routine a piece you know because it was just yeah. dry down and dirty you know and uh, same thing uh, i had an off-broadway show that ran for a couple of years uh five and six nights a week i just used that as a playground too you know like i wouldn't have a full idea but i would want you know here's something i know i want to work on i'm gonna work on this i'm gonna throw it in it's gonna suck but i'm gonna let 
things develop, you know, and sometimes the audience, you know, cause I work a lot of like nightclubs and bars and stuff too, you know, or like right. alternative venues where, where, um, mm -hmm. uh, heckling isn't necessarily a thing, but, but, but you kind of, the, the audience, it interacts with you, you know, like yeah. they'll, 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 they'll say some shit and, and some of, uh, some of the funnier things that I've, uh, heard and, and put in the show have come from those, you know, from those moments it, where like the, the weird, you know, drunk hell's angel in the corner, you know, is like, bah, 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 you know, and then it's like, fuck dude, that's actually funny. Like, all right, I'm going to use that, you know, uh, yeah, like, that funny, <laughs> right. Yeah. Or just like, I mean, and this is, you know, this is, this is uh, what's good about usually I roll with like a tech guy that helps me even with my solo show. So like usually after we've packed up, you know, uh, we'll be, you know, chilling out, you know, and, and going like, fuck, what, what was that thing that guy said? Oh, yeah, you know, and blah, blah, and holy shit, did you see when that happened? Because, you know, if he's front of house, he'll remember shit that I'm not remembering because I'm in show mode, yeah. you know. And yeah. then it's like, holy fuck, we got to, you know, how, how can that happen every night? You know, like, and that's when, that's almost when the creativity gets fun too, you know, to a degree yeah. because you might get an idea. And then it's like, all right, that worked perfect there, but how can, how can it seem organic? How can I lead the audience to that path to where because what i what i don't want to ever do or become is like i don't want to have to have a guy yell and move your feet every time i do death saw you know yeah. i don't want to have to have somebody at the back row you know going turn it around you know like that's a student like, <laughs> I want it to be organic you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh definitely so so that's good like one of the things that i do in like my my russian roulette version uh routine is I talk about the holes in the block of wood. And one of the lines I wrote is, uh, well, I wrote, I came up with whatever, uh, that I started doing was, uh, I talk about this is a, a game that you can make with things you probably already have at home. You need this, this, and this. Next thing you have blocks of wood. These are already made. So you get a stick of wood, you get a saw, a drill. This is the only thing you don't have at home unless you're some kind of weirdo or pervert. And I basically finger fuck the hole in the wood just casually. Like, you know, unless some kind of weirdo or pervert or something like that. I spin it on my finger, I put it down. And I say, you know, uh, you, you're with that guy. If you're not, you know, down with power tools, perhaps he is. And he could make these for you. And the chick goes, yeah, but his hole would be a lot smaller. Right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, that's fucking brilliant. You know? And I was like, holy shit, that is fucking funny. That is good. And I was like, yo, can I? And I even said it on stage. I was like, can I start saying that? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, dude, you cool with that? And he was like, yeah, that's cool, man. You know, and, and that, some of the best stuff comes comes that way too. You know, you can't you can't be king of everything. You know, so uh, so seeking outside help. You know, even though, like I said, I don't jam. I'm not really good at jamming, but I'll you know have ideas or whatever. And I've got you know friends that I trust that usually I'll be like, hey, I got this idea. Uh, I need to make this thing that you know is a gimmick that can flip and do this. And you know, what do you think? You know, could you help me make that? Uh, cause I don't have like a 3d printer or anything like that. And I don't know how to weld, but you yeah, know, I, yeah. I, I go to these other guys and then you never know. Sometimes, you know, these, these other guys might have ideas that make it better, even, you know, change the method completely and go, Oh, we could make it like this, but you know, what if we did, 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 did you know, and that, and it, that's sort of the process as opposed to forcing the creativity or sitting down and, and having, you know, magic jams or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, because that, yeah, that's, that's more that's forcing, more forcing it. Let's all meet on Thursday at four o'clock. I mean, that's not that's not going to be a creative environment. You know, everyone's going to be trying too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I def definitely think that's good advice, and it's like any problem solving thing. Once Everybody. you walk away from the problem, your subconscious works on it. So if you go, "Oh, I have an idea," just stop thinking about it, and you, eventually you'll wake yeah. up the middle of the night with a solution. Just kind of um, walk away. Yeah, yeah, take a walk. It'll come. Definitely. Yeah. And now we have a segment on the show that we call The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, which is basically we ask our guests to tell us a story about a performance or multiple performances where they started off good, went a bit bad, and eventually could only be described as ugly. Do you have, does anything pop into your head? I mean, yeah. A lot. <laughs> I mean, honestly, all the time. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, there's so many. There was one time I was on the road, uh, I, I do, you know, a bit where, um, 
I have this doll I call Baby Stinky, and he's who I throw into the audience to find somebody at random, right? Yeah. So I throw this ugly, mutant, disgusting baby into the audience, and this chick gets it. We were in New Zealand. There's some clips of this on YouTube if people want to look it up. But she was, like, off her face on Molly, Adderall, who, who knows, you know. Yeah. But she was out of her mind. And, uh, and it made for a really, really interesting segment. Uh, but, I mean, stuff like that has happened. Um, I mean, yeah. I've, I've, had, I've had people die. I've had a guy die in, in, in the audience. Um, I've made, ugh, man, I made, I made this mistake. And this is like the one, you, you almost can't come back from this. It, it was so bad. I was doing uh, a show uh, in a bar, in a, uh, one of the uh, like bar club venues, I guess you could say, um, that, I, that, I, that I work. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's dark. And so, uh, I, you know, I need somebody out of the audience. I'm doing the coin bit that I did on yeah. Poolis, right? And so <laughs> and so I get the chick on stage, blah, blah, and at one point I go, you know, oh, you know, the blah, or uh, the dude you're here with, you know, she brought her purse or her phone up or something, I can't remember, but it's like, oh, the dude you're here with could probably hang on to that for you. And and I don't see, you know, because it's dark, and, and I actually need glasses to see distance, uh, so mm -hmm. I can't, you know, so I can't see so good distance, and I and I have night blindness, I need glasses when I drive. So, if, if the theater's dark, like, I, I can barely see what's going on, you know. And so I go, oh, you know, the Dukes looked like a Duke. Well, it wasn't. They were lesbians. And she, this in particular, was a uh, masculine, you know, more yeah. masculine. See, this, I don't know how to say what's right. So if you have lesbians watching or, or anybody that I'm not trying to make fun or, or anything like that. Um, but it's just, it was just one of those things. You know, you, she looked like a dude. From where I was from, she had the hair, she had the physique. It was just sorry, right? You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm her girlfriend, you know, or something. And oh shit, hmm. you know. And at that moment, inside, I'm just like, I'm fucked. I can't come back from this now because everybody is so worked up. You know, that the the crowd wasn't, you know, like ooh, you know, or anything. But I just felt like this, yeah, you know, this awkwardness, like. Oh shit! You know, because I'm sure there were people in the house too that were like, I don't know, it looks like a dude. I don't know, you know, like so. It's like, what do you do? You know, so I had to be like, I'm so sorry. I explained, like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, it's dark. I wear glasses, and so, like, honestly, and you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily believe I'm a character. It's just more like an exaggerated extension, you know. So I don't want to say I broke character, but uh, I want to say I dialed back, and 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 became more human and allowed my. Uh, humanness to show you know and and i tried to say like you know i'm i'm so sorry like i i, I didn't realize it's dark you know and, and there's haze you know the fog the haze the lights da, 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 you know didn't fucking matter like the bullet had left the chamber they were offended she was pissed you know so throughout the whole routine i can tell the girlfriend on stage is pissed too she doesn't want anything to do with it right and and in you've seen the bit with allison in the routine, there's, you know, there's the bit where I say, like, you know, when when you were a little girl, when you guys were all little boys and girls, when I was a little kid, you know, like, it's just a fucking joke, people, you know, and, like, I, I started cutting just out of safety's sake. I started cutting every fucking line that was even remotely, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it, it's also comedy. In comedy, yeah. there's always a victim. You know, like, there's going to be a victim. And if you can't laugh at yourself, someone else will beat you to it, you know. And I always say, like, look at me. I've looked this way since I was, like, 12. Like, I used to steal my mom and grandma's clothes and makeup. Like, trust me, I know, you know, what this is about. And so, like, it just, there was there was no coming back. I didn't come back from that. And they ended up leaving the show. You know, they, they ended up leaving after the bit. They didn't come back. And so I was like, fuck, well, there, there's that. Lost some followers on that one. But whatever you know so that that was pretty bad um there was one time on this last tour just before the pandemic um i was on stage i didn't get the memo from the stage manager no fire was allowed <laughs> and so you know i'm just packing cotton and sparkle out of tip you know i'm getting ramstein for the bird act right and i'm out there fucking shit's blowing up and on fire and birds and all this shit and i start hearing this commotion you know, in the wings. And and I'm like, you know, the music's loud. I don't know what's going on. So I'm like, what's going on over here? You know? And then one of the other acts is like in, like, 
in the wings, right on the lip, going, no fire, quit doing the fire, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know. And I get off stage, and it's like I I started the fucking Chicago fire all over again. I wasn't in Chicago. I was in Portland, which is ironic because I'm pretty sure their city's on fire now. Or it was. But like, so, but it wasn't me. But so isn't that funny how that works out? Six months later, they're, they're down. Yeah, shit, but it wasn't me. But so anyway, so they're just like ready to call the whole show. Like they were ready to drop the fire curtain. The, you know, the locals were just pissed. Simple misunderstanding. You know, I didn't know. I didn't get the message, but holy shit. It almost brought the whole thing to a halt. Finds up the wazoo because it was it was labeled like a historical place, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, that's why it was uh, uh, they were so careful about, you know, and uh, and so that that was my fuck up because usually it's on the, you know, it's on the call sheet. And, you know, when you get off the bus, it's right there. with It just wasn't simple oversight by uh, production. And uh, yeah, that went. That was a little gnarly. Um, there was another time. Uh, this wasn't on stage, but there, there was a lot of backstage commotion with this. It was uh, when I was out on tour with the Triangle Show. Um, uh, there were some guys that had come on board. Well, James Moore from the UK, he came into the show, and uh, another guy, Ben Black. And uh, shit, maybe I shouldn't tell this story. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Let's not tell that story. But. Uh, <laughs> Now that I've said their names, I probably shouldn't tell what happened. But anyways, wasn't my <laughs> fault. Basically, uh, they, they had come into the show, and, and essentially I, I apparently had a reputation for uh, – I, I would leave the, the show when we were done, and I would just go on adventures in every city we were in and find the locals and, you know, whatever, you know, trouble and scallywags, you know, were in each city. And, uh, and so they wanted to come with one night. And, uh, and I was like, I don't really know, you know, kind of a lone wolf here. I don't really hang out much with you guys after the show. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know what this is about. You know, oh, no. Like, where are you going? Okay, well, here's where I'm going. You know, this, this is the place I found. I'm going here. But listen, I'm not your babysitter. You know, I'll get you in. But once we're in, like, you know, you're on your own. And uh, needless to say, they didn't make it back the next morning uh, for the show. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't even make it by intermission. We'll put it that way. And I got pulled into the, uh, to the production office and, uh, was read the riot act and like, as if it was my fault. And so, yeah. you know, that I, happened. I showed up. It's not my fault. I, I, I was showered and, and ready to go. And, you know, I smelled like flowers and, you know, all that, but yeah, I got, to, I got, I got in trouble for that. And, uh, among a lot of other things, but yeah, things, things like that, just backstage commotion too, is always, uh, is always an issue. Yeah, definitely. It's like, I, I it's like you're a bad influence, but it's not your fault. We're all adults. You know, yeah. I made it. You know, I'm nobody's babysitter. Got to run pretty yeah, fast. Yeah. You know, you got to run pretty fast. <laughs> so we just come up on the hour and a half there now, so I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. It's been really entertaining. Great talking to you. Do you have anything you'd like to promote or push or anything like that? Not really, no. No, just no, no. I mean, I don't know. You can find me on Instagram at Dan Sperry, Facebook yeah. is at Dan Sperry Official. Um, you know, talking about classic stuff. I've been. Uh, I used to do a live uh, chat show every Tuesday, and I would do a feature called Old School Magic. So that's yeah. something that I've been uh, putting up a lot. So if you follow me, like on YouTube and on Facebook, I like to feature old school magicians from the past that have been influential either on me directly or on the art. You know, and most of these are are guys that uh, have passed away, you know, so you don't really hear much about them or they're not really um, maybe mentioned, you know, so much. So like I've done everything from Doug Henning to Don Allen, Shimada. Uh, I did Norm Nielsen. Um, and even, even people that are still alive, but maybe have that sort of classic, you know, um, or more, maybe, maybe that uh, aren't, or maybe the classic, Influence style, I guess, but there's yeah. still a lot. I, I don't know how else to yeah. you know. Um, or even I, I, like watched the, I watched the Tommy Cooper one. It was it was really good. Yeah, love awesome. Tommy. Yeah, the Tommy Cooper one. Man, I love Tommy Cooper. So great. Yeah. I, I got a DVD set of his for Christmas a couple of years ago, and it's just brilliant. Like I've I've seen most of his clips already, but it's just definitely one to go back to. If anybody Absolutely. watching doesn't know who he is, YouTube, <laughs> YouTube Tommy oh, Cooper. Oh, yeah. And, and and I could 
him and Mullica are two acts in particular that I never get tired of watching. Like, even if I'm like sitting like uh, on, on my computer here and I'm doing stuff, like I'll play it on my other uh, computer and just, just have it rolling in the background. You know, like just background noise. I can just look over, watch the routine keyboard. Like Tommy Cooper and Tom Mullica are, are two guys that I, I never get tired of watching. You know, their videos that uh, that are online, just great stuff. Every That's time right. I hear Tommy Cooper, just just the word, I just hear jar, 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 spoon, 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 jar, jar. Every time. And now every time <laughs> we see Dance Party, I think that. Magic Moments. Like you, you have Magic Moments stuck in our head, man. It's fucking, it's really in there. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, That's and again, right. back to the music. But yeah, so uh, thanks so much. And if uh, for everyone watching, if you can like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. And if you're on iTunes or Spotify, make sure you follow us to make sure you get the next episode coming up. And again, thanks so much to Dan Sperry. And we'll talk oh, to you next time. Check out the guys, new magic shop, deceivereality.com. Check it out. Yeah, the Ireland's newest magic shop, is uh, deceivereality.com. So make sure you check that out as well. And thanks to everyone. And we'll talk to you again soon.